Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Sunday's edition of the Black Health Trust. I hope that all are well rested after getting that extra hour of sleep today and are energized and ready to jump into what we plan to be a very vigorous discussion addressing the current health status of you and your family. I am joined today by my co-moderator, Dr. Ivan Watts, and I will turn it over to our founder, Dr. Randall Maxey. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And I thank the powers that be for Dr. Barbara Neighbors Stevens and Dr. Ivan Walks. And our prayers are with uh, Dr. Jocelyn, who may not be with us today, but she'll be with us next week. And we thank all of the participants. We're going to have some fun today. And we've talked for a number of months about risk, about the status of your current health. And we're clear that not only do we have risk because of COVID, but we have risk because of our eating habits, risk because of our physiological status, risk because of not following common sense. So we're gonna have a discussion along with some questions that we'd appreciate you addressing. So if everybody has a piece of paper or a tablet that they can keep track, we wanna ask you some questions and then among our moderators and other health professionals and even you on this call, we want responses uh, to these questions. So is that okay? And uh, we're also in the future, uh, next week we know, when is diabetes month, uh, Dr. Barbara? This whole month. Of this whole month. So we're gonna be talking about diabetes. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, mental health coming up. Uh, is that in uh, on the 28th, uh, Dr. Walks? That is correct, sir. Okay. And then on the 21st, we're gonna be talking about uh, a certain form of genetic heart disease called HATTR, uh, featuring uh, a prominent uh, professor at uh, Columbia University. So we've got a full track. So we welcome everybody here. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we know that we are non not for profit. We're not political, even though I'd love to have a political talk one day, I gotta figure out how to do that. I think politics do affect health. And uh, I think we have uh, a promise from uh, a certain congressman to join us sometime soon. I hope we can make sure he knows we would like to hear from him, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Walsh. That would be, Absolutely. be very good. Uh, so let's go forward. Simon, if you can project the uh, first question. And as background, we know that we have a number of vaccines. We know that we have the Pfizer vaccine uh, that's been approved. And we know that we have the Moderna vaccine that's been approved. And we also have approval, even though it may be a bit troubled with the J&J &J vaccine. So we had uh, a task force. We have a task force headed by Dr. Walks and they gave a thorough review of uh, the recommendation of the National Medical Association's Task Force on vaccines and COVID. And we endorsed those findings and came up with our own as well. And in summary, we decided as a group that we believe that the vaccines are very important, especially for communities of color, and that they are safe and that they will mitigate uh, illness in the case you get uh, the vaccine uh, that you'll be hopefully saved from being hospitalized and certainly from death. Uh, and there have been too many deaths uh, because of, we know that also 
that with the current Delta, the vaccines may not prevent you from getting the COVID, but it will certainly mitigate the level of illness and prevent you from dying. We also have learned that it may not prevent you from transmitting uh, the virus. So it is very important that even though people have been vaccinated, that you still use uh, safety precautions with distancing, with wearing masks if you're indoors, uh, and just using common sense in other places. We also know that with increasing AIDS, that seniors uh, are more vulnerable to uh, the virus. And we know that seniors are more vulnerable to having characteristics of heart attacks, more vulnerable to cancer, diabetes, infections, and a number of other things. And we've talked about being able to shore up by our eating habits and exercising uh, to develop a strong immune system. We know that recently uh, Pfizer has had approved uh, the emergency provisions of a uh, pediatric vaccine so that now we can vaccinate children as young as five years old. Uh, and we do know also from reports that we've had here in the Black Health Trust that infants uh, do receive immune protection from the mother's uh, breast uh, milk uh, when uh, she feeds that. So we're also told that the, the artificial food may not be as well for infants as breast milk. We'll let uh, Dr. Neighbor comment on that later since she is a, uh, a pediatrician. We also know from our discussions that it is impossible to get the virus from the mRNA vaccines. We know that there's been a lot of misinformation out there. So having said that, uh, and as a jumping off point for our discussion, let's go to the next slide, Simon. And if somebody would read that first question, uh, Dr. Neighbor. Sure. If a person has both diabetes and high blood pressure, a not uncommon situation, what should their target blood pressure numbers be? Should it be 120 over 80, 150 over 90, or 100 over 80? So if you would write your choice, and you can check all that apply, and take about 15 seconds to do that, then we want to discuss that. And if there are any questions, we'll answer them as we go. So it is, if you have both diabetes and high blood pressure, what should your target blood pressure be? That's been about 15 seconds, right? Yeah. Okay. So does anybody so, want to venture? So, so Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Maxey, before you go to that, I want to take everybody back to junior high school for a minute. Because when someone puts an answer in the chat, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right answer. So don't look on somebody else's paper and just write their answer down. We really want folks to, to think about what they think the right answer is. <laughs> Y'all know that I'm just, I'm, I'm just joking with the person that put this in the chat. But we, we, we really do want you to think about what those numbers mean and what you think those numbers should be, and then look at the correct answer in the chat. Okay. So, is anybody venturing an answer or a question? Okay, the correct answer, and there's actually been debate in the medical community. Uh, at one time, just a few years ago, the target was 140 over 90. But the literature has shown 
that the morbidity and mortality rate goes way down when you target 120 over 80 as the correct target. There's less heart attacks, less cardiovascular disease, less strokes. So the real target is 120 over 80. Now we do know that if your pressure is 150 over 90, you have a higher chance of having uh, cardiovascular illnesses, whether it be a stroke, whether it be a heart attack, renal disease. Looking at number C, 100 over 80, that's a good pressure if you can get it. Uh, but a lot of seniors might find that they might uh, be a bit lightheaded or dizzy if their pressure is that low. So the appropriate choice, and this is 120 over 80, that's from my view. Uh, any other discussion on that? We've got some neurosurgeons on, some psychiatrists, some pediatricians, and we do know that blood pressure changes moment to moment with emotion, with upset, with local situations. But I believe that that choice of 120 over 80 is the correct choice. Any other comments on that, doctors? I would just make a comment in terms of practicality. It is generally suggested that um, the best, the most accurate um, blood pressure and the one to follow uh, closely if you're monitoring at home is that blood pressure in the morning when you first get up before you move around. Um, and if you wanna do some experiments, you'll find that if you take random readings throughout the day, that there will be different levels. But the most important thing, and I'm sure your uh, individual providers will advise you of this is, whatever time it is that you're taking your blood pressure, make sure when you're logging it, that you do it at the same time every day so that you can see what the consistent pattern is. Dr. And, Niver, and, I've got a comment and a question for you. And well, part let of me, it, go ahead. Well, part of my question is anatomical and part of it is physiological. Uh, I believe that um, emotion, stress, and a number of things can play a role in affecting high blood pressure. And the anatomical uh, comment is that I have never been able to find in the literature what the very last nerve is that people talk about. You got on my last nerve. And how can that affect blood pressure? Uh, so, so Dr. Maxey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not comment on the fact that your question is getting on my, anyway, <laughs> let me, let me, let me say this about that. I think that it's important for us to recognize that blood pressure does vary. That's why Dr. Neighbor Stevens' comment is so important, that you wanna to try to take your blood pressure around the same time every day, not take it just after you've run up the stairs, not take it just after you've come to an urgent care center because you're upset about something. Whatever is going on that could possibly upset you could impact the blood pressure that you get. So same time every day, when you're relaxed, just waking up makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, over time, people worrying you, uh, getting on wherever that last nerve is. I think it's different places for different people, but people just bothering you, making you feel out of sorts is not a good thing for a lot of reasons, including your, your blood pressure. The thing I always struggle with when I'm talking to patients about blood pressure is everybody can take their heart rate, just take your pulse, but how do you take your blood pressure? And so there are these blood pressure cuffs they, that, that you can get different kinds, go on your arm, go on your wrist. The most important thing is to learn how to use it. They usually come with directions. And so you can, you can get comfortable with getting an accurate blood pressure at home and then take it regularly and take it routinely. One other comment I'll make about blood pressure is, and there are times when I have to uh, prescribe medications that can directly impact the uh, blood pressure. And so I will especially tell folks to do two things. One of them is let your primary care doctor know what medication I'm adding or subtracting or changing so that your primary care person, your conductor of your medical orchestra can be informed about what 
what it is that you're doing. And then also track and see if that new medication changes that blood pressure that you've been tracking over the last, um, hopefully long time, months, whatever it is that you're doing, tracking your blood pressure. So those are my comments about, about blood pressure. I think it really is important to learn how to do it at home and do it consistently. Well, thank you very much. Now, the other comments on that, that we do know that there are increased uh, levels of cardiovascular accidents, which are known as strokes, uh, that can happen with high blood pressure. In particular, the type of stroke called a hemorrhagic stroke that results in, uh, in bleeding. And uh, we'll ask Dr. Gary Dennis later to maybe comment on that. But the correct answer, I tell my patients that the lower your blood pressure can be, the more consistent that is with long life. As long as you can get up and walk across the floor without being dizzy, low blood pressure correlates with longer life. Now, there is no normal condition known as low blood pressure. If when you stand up, and as we get older, I tell people, don't just jump up out of a chair, don't just jump up out of bed, but get up normally or easily. But if you suffer dizziness or um, what we call orthostatic hypotension, uh, you probably are low on fluid. And one of the things that people do frequently is not drink enough water. And I believe the guidelines are about 10 uh, pints of water uh, should be in per day. Uh, some people have uh, poor valves in their uh, lower legs and the veins and arteries in their lower legs and they get orthostatic hypotension that way. In that case, we prescribe something uh, called uh, uh, restrictive stockings uh, for them to wear, uh, TED hose, uh, they're called. And uh, so you wanna be well hydrated and do that. But if your blood pressure is low, such that when you walk, you need to see your primary care physician uh, maybe you're anemic, maybe you're not well hydrated enough, maybe you have a form of uh, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, anything else we need to talk about on this particular set of questions, Dr. Nathan Stevens? No, the chat is clear. I think we can move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, can, I, can, can I make one comment about what's in the chat? Um, there, there is a, a reference in the chat that a doctor at an urgent care center uh, recently um, told that the target should be 150 over 90. And I think it goes back to what Dr. Maxey said earlier in a way that as we get smarter, as we learn more, as we have more research, we will sometimes change the target numbers. But when you're looking in an emergency setting, sometimes what the doctor is really telling you is what, what number is that emergency number that should make you worry and that should make you go and get some help as opposed to what number is the target number for you to stay steady state every day. So Dr. Maxey, does, does what I just said make sense that you'll that's sometimes an, uh, get an emergency number from the emergency that, people? That's an excellent point that you're making. As we said before, blood pressure does go up and down. When your blood pressure is 150 over 90, that's not necessarily something to make you wanna to run to an emergency room and tell them you're having a stroke. Uh, but the target is 120 over 80. But your blood pressure will go up and down during the course of the day. Now, if your diastolic goes above 100, I would be concerned. If your uh, systolic, which is the top number, uh, goes above uh, 180, 190, that is definitely uh, too high. So the target is 120, but Dr. Walks brings up an excellent point about the range. So you should talk to your uh, physician. We do know that over time, uh, people uh, get hardening of the arteries because they do things like smoke. Uh, they take in too much uh, trans fat. Uh, they uh, drink a lot of uh, caffeinated coffee. If a person comes into my office and I get a high blood pressure, I automatically ask them, did you drink coffee this morning? So 
Uh, that is one of the effects of coffee and some caffeinated teas uh, as well. Uh, so that was an excellent pickup, uh, uh, Doctor, on that. Uh, we also know that uh, for families that are hypertensive, and hypertension does run in families, uh, that if you were to look under a microscope at the blood vessel from the child of somebody with a hypertensive family, you'll find that that blood vessel is thicker. Uh, so, 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 so that is a problem. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide, Dr. Barbara. If a person has diabetes, what should their target blood sugar or glucose be? A, 116 milligrams percent or less. B, 150 milligrams percent or less or C, 90 milligrams percent or less, or more, I'm sorry, or more. So let's take a few seconds for that. And we'd love to have your thoughts on that if you'd put them into the chat. So this is not a test for a grade, this is a test for discussion and understanding. And you know, I wanna go back when we get through with this discussion, or actually I can, I can blend it in to the, the, this discussion. I think it would be wise for us to just kind of comment on some of the common myths that I hear people say, both about their high blood pressure and their diabetes. Okay, well, good. Do we have anybody venturing an answer, whether it's A, B, or C? We have one answer of A, which is 116 or less. Okay. So why is an elevated blood sugar potentially bad over time? Uh, and a lot of people have heard about the term hemoglobin A1C. And that is known medically as glycosylated hemoglobin. Now, I have some friends up in uh, Northern Virginia who belong to a group called the Executive Leadership Council and they eat a lot of very fancy rich food. And one of the foods that I had when I was with them one time was called creme brulee. Creme brulee, I can't even say it right. <laughs> And creme brulee is a custard, but it has a glaze on top of it. And the way they make that glaze on top of the creme brulee is to use something akin to a blowtorch to melt that sugar and form something like plastic on top of that, very crisp and actually quite good. Well, in the body, if your blood sugar or blood glucose is higher than normal, the blowtorch is your body temperature of 98.6. And it forms with that elevated sugar, a glycosylation, which is like forming little spicules of plastic. And those little spicules of plastic, which is sugar crystallized, gets into your blood vessels. And it can cause them to thicken, to be less compliant, can cause the growth of plaque that uh, you can deposit lipids into it, develop more hardening of the arteries. And eventually you can get the things that go along with diabetes. Diabetes isn't necessarily a disease of just the elevated blood sugar, but it's a disease of the blood vessels. For example, a lot of people with high blood sugar develop a diabetic retinopathy they develop diabetic kidney disease and end up on dialysis. They develop the, the diabetic peripheral artery disease and they end up getting numb feet, getting pins, like a pin-like sticking feeling in their feet. And some even have to get amputations of their toes and then their feet and ultimately their legs. So that can be a big problem. And all that is because of the glycosylated hemoglobin. So we want that target number for the glycosylated hemoglobin to be less than 
7.8. And the correct number, and we can debate it, for your blood sugar is to be 116 or less. That is a target. Huh? I don't think so either. Now that is for a person with diabetes. Let's underscore that. So, <laughs> so can I can can I ask um, how important it is again that folks understand when to take that measurement? Because I may be doing a great job with my diabetes, but let's say I went to one of those fancy dinners with with Dr. Maxi. And, and today is the one day a month when I have some creme brulee. And so, and thank you, Dr. Maxi, for letting the Black Health Trust become a cooking show. I'm gonna go try to make some creme brulee later on. But, <laughs> but I just had a dinner. I just had some dessert. When are we talking about this 116 or less? That is fasting. That is before you eat. Uh, when we test people for diabetes, we do something called a glucose tolerance test, where we measure their fasting glucose, and then we give them a bottle of sugar water to drink, and we test over three or four hours the curve described by the elevated glucose going down. So this 116 is what you should strive to have when you wake up in the morning and take uh, your blood glucose. Of course, if you eat, after you eat breakfast, eat lunch, it's going to be higher. So your morning or fasting glucose uh, should be uh, that number. And the reason I think that number is correct is because many people at 90 or less may start to feel hypoglycemic. And the symptoms of hypoglycemia might be uh, sweating, might be shaking, nausea and vomiting, in which case you might want to eat a piece of hard candy or drink some orange juice or have a piece of cream brulee. So, 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 so Dr. Maxi, are you saying that answer number A and answer number C are correct? No, I'm saying answer number A is the correct one. Okay, so answer number C is 90 milligrams or more. So we want to stay we don't, we don't want to go below, below 90 when we're fasting. Is that, is that part of your, your, your yeah, statement? Yeah, that's statement? right. And I see what you're pointing at. Would that be a, a good range to be in? I think 90 is getting kind of dangerous uh, for most people. So I would slick number eight, but I see the part that you're picking. Would it be okay if you're between 90 and 116? The answer would be correct. Okay. Now, I want to, again, uh, underscore the fact that we're talking about persons who have diabetes, there are different values that are considered appropriate for people who are truly not diabetic. And the other point I wanted to underscore is if you are concerned that you might have diabetes, please discuss this with your uh, primary care physician or provider because there are uh, two or three different appropriate paths that can be taken to manage, uh, to, to, to diagnose and manage um, or determine if you in fact have diabetes or this actually not real medical condition called prediabetes. But um, the bottom line is pay attention to your numbers. Now I wanna get into some of these myths and I'm not talking about somebody now necessarily who is already diabetic. But some of the things that, I've, that I have heard, and I'm sure other clinicians on the call have heard. For example, I've heard people say, oh, I don't need to worry about taking my blood pressure because I can tell when I have, when my blood pressure is high. I get a nosebleed when my blood pressure is high. Or I sweat when, I, when my blood pressure is high. I am not going to say that you do not sweat. And I am not going to say that you may in fact have a nosebleed, but your blood pressure can be high without you having any physiologic symptom. And it, that is why we emphasize the importance of um, actually taking the blood pressure correctly. Um, I have heard, and I'm sure others of you have heard, 
uh, diabetes is comes from eating too much sugar. That's probably the most common statement I've heard about the etiology of diabetes. And related to that, I don't eat that much sugar, so I don't have to worry about having diabetes. If you come from a family that has a history of diabetes, you need to be checked periodically because you do have an increased risk. If you are obese, you have an increased risk of having diabetes and high blood pressure. So your numbers need to be checked. Very I, hate good. To the, I hate to be the downer on the team, but really, no, let's be I think, real. I think that is very important that you just brought that up. In fact, the, they call that high blood pressure the silent killer. But the other thing uh, that is important, if you have both diabetes and high blood pressure, which one is the most important to treat? The elevated blood pressure or the elevated diabetes? <coughs> and that's a, an important question because <laughs> very important. They both do damage. And I, don't well, I would know. say it's not a zero sum game. <laughs> both, both should be identified and both should be managed. Uh, my, my answer is if you have a doctor ask you which one you think they should treat, you need a new doctor. Well, actually, I, I put this in there for a very controversial reason. There was a large study of quite a few thousand patients that did show that it is more important to treat the blood pressure. There are more uh, fatal events and more morbid events that occur in a diabetic from the elevated blood pressure than there are from the elevated glucose. They're both very important, so you're correct on that. The study was called the UKPDS study. It was very large and uh, uh, it was very key to control that blood pressure first at all costs. And uh, that does have an effect on the glucose. And there are a number of, uh, of other things that are inappropriate for us to go into on this show that have to do with the metabolism of glucose, and diabetes, and all the hormones. That, and, and so it is very important to control that blood pressure in a diabetic very tightly because they have differential effects on that. Now, there's uh, a question uh, in the chat that I, I think we want to make sure everyone is clear on. That question is, why would the blood sugar numbers differ for non-diabetic patients than from diabetic patients? In that one ticket. What is that question again? Why are the, the appropriate blood sugar numbers different for non diabetic versus diabetic patients? They shouldn't be. Well, I think what the question, I think what the confusion point might be is what is normal and what is not normal. If you have normal blood sugar levels, then you do not have diabetes. If you have diabetes and you're on treatment for your diabetes, there are different numbers used because of the management issues in play in the treatment of diabetes. So I, I hope that makes it a little clearer. So diabetes is present when you have lack of absorption, lack of uptake of glucose into muscle and into tissues. So when you do a glucose tolerance test, you consider diabetic if your curve of glucose uptake is abnormal and slow. And maybe when we have our conversation in two weeks, or one week, whatever it is on diabetes, we can discuss that 
uh, because there's interaction that's complex between the liver and the pancreas uh, that have an effect on that. But the numbers are the same. It is the curve described by the uptake of glucose in the blood. Why don't we go to the next slide? Um, be, before we go on, Dr. Maxey, let me, because uh, Dr. Barbara Neighbor Stevens brought up some of the, the myths and we talked about one of the risk factors being um, obesity. I think it's important for us to, to, to just clearly state that you can't look at someone and tell if they have diabetes. You can't look at someone and say, well, you're overweight, you're obese, so you must have diabetes. There are a lot of people who have diabetes that are not overweight. So again, this, this common sense message about regular routinely going to your doctor for a checkup, having things checked to make sure, it's very difficult to look at someone and tell what they have and what they don't have. Very good. So we ready for the next one? Yes. If a 50 year old or older family member develops severe chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting, you should do which of the following? A, call your pastor. B, give that person an aspirin. C, call 911. D, ask your lawyer. Or E, do nothing. So A would be right if it's our pastor on the call. A is, A is always right. It may not be the first thing that you do, but it's never a wrong answer. So let's discuss some of those answers. Anybody put anything into the chat? C then A. What now? C, call 911, and then A, call your pastor. Okay. And why do we think 911 is the correct answer? And I think it is the correct answer. But in a 50 plus year old person uh, with severe chest pain, shortness of breath, and especially if they have nausea and vomiting, of course it could be something like indigestive, right? But that wouldn't be the thing that you would call 911. This describes classically uh, what could be a heart attack where you feel like there's an elephant sitting on your chest, you can't get your breath, uh, you may be sweating, you may have nausea and vomiting, but pain could be in your jaw, it could be in your back, it can be in your side. But you want that differential to be made uh, by an emergency room, uh, by a physician, it's better to be safe than to be sorry. And we suggest you do call 911. Uh, it's also been suggested that you give that person an aspirin because in many cases, uh, an, an aspirin does something to uh, alleviate platelet aggregation, uh, the clotting that can occur, uh, thrombosis occurring in a coronary artery and it has been known to uh, mitigate against a heart attack progressing. Uh, you should always call your pastor like Dr. Walk says, uh, or pray and do the things that we know that spiritually work. Um, I don't know that the lawyer adds much and you certainly don't want to do nothing. You should take that very serious. Are there any other comments or considerations we should talk about in this question? Well, yes, there is something in the chat which is, which is addressing something that I was going to also bring up. You made the very clear statement that what's contained in this question are the classic symptoms associated with a heart attack. 
But what we also don't want to not mention is that there are frequently much different symptoms present in women. And so just because this 50 plus year old family member is a woman and does not have these symptoms does not mean that her vague complaints of fatigue or just not feeling right in the stomach or the chest should be ignored. When in doubt, contact someone, a, prof a health professional. That is correct. And we know that there's a high percentage of women, especially black women who go to an emergency room with even the symptoms that we described in this question and they get turned away. Certainly if it's something different and less than this, they suffer a lot more to be turned away. So you should insist that your family member receive at least in that emergency room, they need to draw blood, look for cardiac enzymes. They need to do an electrocardiogram at the very least, for some, they can do a CT angiogram, but don't let them turn you around without a full examination. If you've gotten up to go to that emergency room, make sure uh, you get uh, fully evaluated uh, because it could be something very damaging or very deadly. That's a good point you brought up, Doctor. Appreciate that. Let's go to the next one. At your next family gathering, attendees should A, all be vaccinated except children five to 16 years old, B, not have to be vaccinated, C, wear a mask while eating, D, be required to take ivermectin before arriving. So we got Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. So there are going to be some family gatherings. <coughs> what do we think about these potential answers? Could we could we add answer? Could we add choice E? None of the above. Okay, none of the above. But I was just about to put you on the spot, Doctor Walks, and say. What are going to be the rules at the Waltz House at Thanksgiving? Uh, we're we're keeping keeping the door locked and just cooking enough food for the people inside. <laughs> Man, I but, just gotten your address. I was going to show up. So, so at our at our next fa family gathering, the reason that I I asked for E, none of the above, is is because. You know, we can have children vaccinated now who are five to 16. And so I think everyone who can be vaccinated should be vaccinated. And at Dr. Dr. Max here, Dr. Neighbor Stevens, you are both welcome to, because I know you've both been vaccinated and boosted. And I think it's important that we are very clear with folks that we want them to be welcome in our homes, but they need to be vaccinated. And yeah, you can take your mask off while you eat, but it's not a bad idea to wear your mask while you're walking around with other people that you don't normally live with. I don't, I don't see why we would say, well, when you come in the house, take your mask off. Eh, I don't, I, there's not a good reason to do that. Um, Could I push you on a little bit, Dr. Walks? Yes, ma'am. I mean, it's, you know, kind of obvious, it's hard to eat with a mask on. Well, what about when you're sitting around the card table playing whist? Dr. Dr. Neighbor Stevens, um, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, default to Dr. Maxey's statement about common sense. I think it's possible to send folks to Boston and give a snide comment and all of that while you have a mask on. Right. I think that wearing a mask in the middle of activities that don't require you to have the mask off, like eating, um, I think it sets a good example. It lets folks know that you are pretty serious about 
what's what's going on. And we talked earlier about the fact that you can be fully vaccinated, not be actually symptomatic, but still be having the virus and passing the virus around. So family gatherings typically include people who are a lot older than 50 years old, as in the last question. So if we're going to have you know, grandma around, big mom around, however you want to call those people that are older, keep in mind that they, I think it was last week on the Black Health Trust, we were told that your immune system is strongest when you're nine years old. I am way past nine years old. And so people who are older than us that are around that have been fully vaccinated, we still want to make sure we try to protect them. Um, we talked a little bit about Colin Powell, who had some underlying health challenges, was fully vaccinated, but still passed away from COVID-19 complications. So I'm not gonna be bashful about saying to folks, you can't come in unless you're vaccinated, please. Uh, you know, I love you, I wanna see you, but you gotta be vaccinated to come in the house. Don't be around um, our, our senior folks without being vaccinated. And why not wear a mask when, you go to when, you, when you're going to hug grandma? Nothing, nothing wrong with that. So, you know, I went to see a patient, Dr. Walsh, uh, the other night. I don't do home visits, but this lady was a good friend of my mom. She's 104 years old, and I went to out of respect to see her. So when I walked in, she was sitting in the room, but her daughter directed me directly to a sink with soap and water. We had to scrub. We, are, we had on our mask anyway, but they were very, very appropriately protective of that lady. And I respected that so much uh, to do that. Um, and, you know, we all want grandma, great grandma not to have a problem. And it'd be a hard thing to have on your conscience that you contributed to something terrible happening uh, to one of our loved ones like that. That's such a good point. Uh, what about newborns, Dr. Uh, Neighbor Stevens? If you have a newborn in the, in the homestead during Thanksgiving, how do you treat them? So, so I, I am going to say something and I'm going to you know, acknowledge that this is not something that the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, sanctions. I'm, this goes back to that common sense um, philosophy that we have. And this is pre-COVID. I have always told my new moms while they were in the nursery, before they went home, that that baby did not need to go to the grocery store. That baby did not need to go visit everybody in the family. And you also need to be very discriminating about who you let into your house and come near that baby. This is, this goes back years. Now we're in the time of COVID. If the mother, while she was pregnant, received the vaccine, she developed some antibodies which did cross the placenta and enter the baby. And once the baby was born and she's breastfeeding, she is giving additional amounts of antibody to that baby through breast milk. I still say that baby doesn't need to go to the grocery store and you need to be very particular about who you let in your house. And if you do let them in the house and near the newborn, they need to do just like that family did protecting that um, 104 year old family member. You need to make sure that they were, um, you know, hands are, clean mask on and they probably shouldn't even this is my opinion they probably shouldn't even be let in the house if they're not vaccinated good point can Agreed. you send your comments a minute and speak about this uh emergency authorization uh use of vaccinating five-year-olds and above now uh, while you're while you're doing that, Dr. Dr. Neighbor Stevens, uh, Dr. Maxey, you mentioned earlier that we would get some comments from uh, Dr. Gary Dennis, and he did have some comments. So maybe we can get him unmuted while Dr. Neighbor Stevens is making her comments. Good. The fact 
the fact that the vaccine is now available under the emergency use authorization for kids five to 11 is first of all, critically important to the kids and their family members, mm -hmm. but also critically important to all of us. Because until that significant population of vulnerable people are protected, we will not be able to get this pandemic under control. So for their own personal health and well-being and for the health and well-being of all of us, I hope parents will seriously consider uh, getting their children immunized. The concerns about safety, I have heard echoed the concerns that we heard about the adult vaccine, vaccines. I think that we have had significant enough time and a significant number of people immunized worldwide to be able to have some confidence in the, in the decision-making process and the conclusions reached by the FDA and the CDC. Agreed. Can I, make some, can I make some comments? Yes, sir. This is Dr. Dennis. Uh, and I agree with the last statements. They're, they're very, very important. And all, all children should be vaccinated as soon as possible. But I was going to make uh, some comments about diabetes and hypertension. As far as the hypertension is concerned, it, it is one that if out of control, can cause fatal outcomes if not treated quickly. So it, it's, it's, it's going to be more dangerous not to treat it first. But also there is a tendency to focus on round numbers rather than pick apart with the blood pressure. When the systolic blood pressure gets over 100 or 200, the patient is probably going to have a massive stroke and die. So it's important to remember that the systolic blood pressure is, is the one that will keep them from going home. So the best thing to do is to try to find out information about something about the blood pressure when you get the call so that you, you know whether the patient is having an acute emergency or not. If the patient has uh, a very high systolic, he could be on the verge of having a massive hemorrhage or have one in development. If at the same time he's complaining, not of his chest, he's complaining of a headache. The law is for massive headache, new headache, bad headache, then that's gonna put him in a different category. So it's very important to stay close to your family doctor when it comes to managing your systemic illnesses like that. And so I just wanted to make a, a comment about it. The other thing is that blood pressure is not uniform during sleep. It, it changes at different times and more at night, it tends to be much higher than you think. And unless you are regularly taking blood pressure, around the clock when you have the symptoms, you really don't know whether that's true or not. But it's important to, to know what the blood pressure is like. And so the patient should know how to take his own blood pressure, number one. But number two, it's, it's very important to know that taking that aspirin may help. But what also happens when you take aspirin, it, it may predispose the patient to developing a hemorrhage itself. So you have to be careful about taking aspirin, even the, 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 even the 81 milligram lab aspirin, if you don't really know the patient's history. So it's important to get all the information you can about a, a potential uh, intracerebral hemorrhage associated with the decompensating blood pressure. That's all. So, so would you speak a minute, a bit more about what is a cerebral hemorrhage, but also your comments on the wisdom of getting an aspirin 
when you have chest pain? Well, when you have chest pain, let's just deal with that. I think taking an aspirin, if you don't have a, a prior history of taking it and or a heart attack or stroke, then it's probably not not as, as dangerous. But if you do have that history, you have the history of, of taking non anti-inflammatories, you know, aspirin type drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have to take that into consideration. The patient's already taken it and the patient is developing worsening symptoms, worsening blood pressure. It's, it's, and, and it's having chest pain too. Then that patient <coughs> is more likely to have a serious cerebral vascular event and so it, it has to be taken into consideration. And it's, it's more dangerous to have a patient with bad systolic hypertension walking around and getting worse and without treatment. But the aspirin will help in the case of the patient who has a history of heart disease and previous stroke. So it's important to, to do two things, uh, care for the patient and then connect with, uh, with a health healer. Someone is gonna be available uh, to give you advice and send you to the emergency room when necessary. So the 911 has to be addressed as well. Do you have any other question about what I've said, Dr. Max? No, I think that's good advice. Uh, and there is even new advice on whether or not the 81 milligrams of aspirin to be given on a daily basis, but we'll talk about it on a program where we can go more into it. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Number five. Are there household members at risk for serious illness or de death from COVID-19 in your house? If so, who has the highest risk? A, children zero to five years old. No. B, seniors 65 and older. Yes. C, adults 18 to 50 years. D, children six to 16 years old. E, anyone unvaccinated. Greatest, greatest risk is seniors 65 plus. So Dr. Dr. Dennis gave us the answer without giving people the time to put their answers in the chat or write them down. <laughs> well, I tell you, that Dr. Dennis, he's too smart. Well, let's discuss that a minute, even though I'm agreeing with him. Dr. Barber, what about those zero to five years old? Well, the key wording in the question is risk for serious illness or death not risk for infection. So the children zero to five have demonstrated that they have a much lower risk for serious illness and death than adults. That's not to say that they don't get infected. And it's not to say that some of them don't in fact get serious illness or death, but their rate is much lower. What about E? There are uh, different risk rates for different age groups and categories of people. So I would not say E is correct by saying anyone unvaccinated. So could you my, say, go ahead, Ivan. So my, my comment about this, this question is that I always have concern when we apply risk stratifications and all of that to individuals. Because when they say one in a million, um, I could be that one. When they say 1%, I could be that one. And I think um, it's important for us to not have anyone feel that, well, the highest risk is seniors. 
whether they're vaccinated or not, because their immune systems may not be as strong. They may not be responding as well. So anybody who's not a senior, it's okay. That's not the message that we want to give with this question. This is one of those questions where, okay, yeah, the answer might be seniors, but everybody ought to be vaccinated who can be vaccinated and people should keep their mask on. That's the safest for everyone involved. And so I think it's important for us to, yes, as scientific, medical people, whatever it is that we are, all of those research studies and all of that are great because they give us these risk stratifications. At the same time, um, I don't wanna be the last person to die from COVID. Somebody is gonna be the last person that's unvaccinated that is under 65 that dies from COVID. I don't wanna be that last person. So for me, I'm gonna make sure I'm vaccinated. I'm gonna make sure I get my, my um, mask and keep my mask on because why not? Why would I not wanna keep everybody as protected as I could? Okay, very good. Um, Simon, can you let me share share a the screen a minute before we go to the next slide? I have a. Uh, um, can you see my slide? Yes. Um, I don't know where it went. Yeah, I was gonna say it's gone now. Well, I guess I won't share it. All right, can we go back to, I guess, question seven? Yeah. Okay, you want to read that one? It's not showing yet. I think it's coming. Next one. Do all family members eligible to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 need to be vaccinated? Yes or no? Yes. Or it's not sure? A, yes, B, no, C, not sure. Yes. So, so Dr. Neighbor Stevens, this, this question is for folks who have never been to the Black Health Trust before and just tuned in 30 seconds ago, right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. This is to test the effectiveness of Black Health Trust. <laughs> well, everybody should get 100% on that one, right? Right. Let's go to the next one. Do all family members over the age of three years old need to wear a mask when indoors in public spaces? A, yes. B, no. C, not if they took hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis. Is, this, is, this, is this question for um, Aaron Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So we know that the answer to that is yes. So can, can I just can I just take a, um, a moment with this this question to say something that we've said before, but I think it bears repeating, which is it isn't just have on a mask. If I see one more person with their mask on just just barely on the top part of the bottom of their chin. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to scream. Just, just, just take it off. <laughs> just, it's not doing you any good when it's only covering the bottom of your chin. It's covering no part of your nose and no part of your mouth. And I think it's important for us, and maybe doc, Dr. Barber can, can um, hit this a little bit better than I can, but our kids watch what we do. And if we're going to walk around with our mask under our mouth or under our nose, guess what our kids are going to do? And I see that all the time when I'm out in the grocery store or what have you. I see people, yeah, I'm, I have on a mask, but, but, but come on. And, and don't pull your mask down when you're trying to talk to somebody. Well, let me get the mask out of the way so I can talk to you, uh, especially when you're talking with someone 
the mask ought to be up. So just those are just things that I that I get frustrated about. All right, let's go to the next question. There is a comment uh, in response, I think, to what you just said, Dr. Walks. Uh, uh, wear a face shield. Now, you know, we, I don't believe our, our resident virologist is on today, but we've talked about the effectiveness of face shields. And so maybe we need to revisit that again. Number eight, do you have a family physician or provider? Uh, uh, excuse me, Dr. Neighbor Stevens. You said that we told folks about the effectiveness of face shields. You don't want to give just a, a quick summary about yes no, or no? I want I want to tease. <laughs> oh, no. I've got to fly to California this week. Should I have my face shield on and my mask? Uh, if It wouldn't hurt, but it probably is not necessary. Okay. Thank you. I'm wearing my face Although, shield anyway. Although, you know, now I'm gonna make an, an aside. You may wanna wear a football helmet with a face guard over your mask because these people think that it's okay to have fights on airplanes these days. Oh my goodness, okay. You didn't, you didn't see that one coming? Okay. I, I, I did not see that one coming. And, 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 and I sit in the back with the regular people, so I might have to, I might have to, you know, get a window seat and just duck. <laughs> so, no, so hey. This oh. question was for Dr. Jordan, Dr. Wilbur Jordan. <laughs> Number eight, do you have a family physician or provider? A, yes. B, no. C, none available. You don't have to respond in chat to that one, but we do want to make the point that if at all possible, you need to have a family uh, cl clinical resource that you can contact. As you know, we say every week that we are not giving you your professional advice. We are urging you every time to contact your personal clinician and discuss the specifics of your situation with your provider. Okay, this is good. I want to see if I can show that slide again. Um, am I able to share yet? I'm not able to share. I think, yeah. I think Dr. Maxi, I think we are seeing your computer. I think you have the slides we've been reading from up. Maybe if you can change what you're showing. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I don't seem to know how to do that. Um, but I had a slide from a slide deck that doesn't seem, let me try one more thing. No. So take away my slides here and I'll just tell you verbally what it was. I was trying to show you. Uh, <clears throat> I had a slide titled Mortality multipliers and a, a progression from left to right it showed your risk of death if you only had an elevated blood sugar then it showed your increased risk of death if you only had elevated blood pressure then it showed if you had an elevated blood pressure and an elevated glucose and it went up quite a few percentage points if you had both and then if you added some kidney disease it went up even more the point is when you have more than one illness mm -hmm. they're additive and in some places they almost become a logarithmic progression so when you have diabetes, when you have high blood pressure, when you have obesity, uh, when you have stress, when you add all those together, that unreasonably multiplies your chance of having 
a morbid or mortal event. Uh, so we have to get our risk factors down. At one point in this battle against COVID, we were being offended uh, because people were saying that we're dying because we have risk factors. That's true. It is very true. And the COVID itself can be fatal all by itself. But to add the fact that many of us are obese, that adds a number of very damaging hormones. If you're centripetally fat around the, the waist and look like an apple as opposed to a pear, one of the things that increases are the enzymes that lead to a cytokine, cytokine storm, which attack the lungs. We know that there's tumor necrosis factor. Uh, then we know that there's increased uh, production of angiotensin II, which has to do with increased blood pressure and strokes, et cetera. So all of these factors need to be controlled. And you can control these in part by appropriate smart eating, appropriate and smart exercise and care of self. So are there any questions that we should discuss that are in the chat, uh, Dr. Ivan and Dr. Barbara? And uh, I invite some of our uh, professional members to comment or if anybody has questions, where are we now? I don't see any questions, but I would uh, like to make a couple of comments about this week's data points because I did notice something uh, reported on TV that was a little misleading and just goes to show you, you need to do your own research. So where we are right now, since the beginning of all of this is uh, we're at 46,358,362 cases of COVID. I wanted to bring this up again because 11.5% of all those cases occurred in African-Americans. The total daily cases is down um, and the total US deaths have um, increased to uh, 751,000. 535, but again, African-Americans are disproportionately represented in those numbers by accounting for 13.5% of all of those US deaths. And then I wanted to skip on down to uh, vaccines. Uh, there have been a total of 429,442,508 vaccines administered. I heard, this is what I wanted to really talk about, I heard on uh, one of the uh, cable channels, uh, they were very happy to say that 70% of Americans are fully vaccinated. That is not a true statement. What is actually a true statement is that 58.3% of all US um, citizens are fully vaccinated. 70% of Adults 18 and older are vaccinated. So I don't want people, because what they tried, what they did say was the next sentence was we're at 70%. We are close to getting the pandemic under control. That is not where we are. So I really wanted to make a point of clarifying that. Then as far as the boosters are concerned, um, so far, 23,175,000, I mean, 175,194 doses of the boosters have been given, which represents uh, that, that, uh, that have occurred in 12% of the population. You might not be surprised um, to hear that, I'm sorry, Yes, that represents 12% of the whole population. But if you look at different age groups, you'll see that there are different percentages. And it won't be surprising to hear that 50 year old and greater represent 20%, 65 and older represent 30% of those that have received the boosters. So I thought that that was kind of an interesting take on um, our data today. Uh I've got a, a question. I heard a discussion 
there was one of these programs on CNN and this uh, lady, Lisa Lynn or Lisa somebody was talking to people that belong to these militias, both right wing, left wing and center wing militias. And there was an interesting thought that occurred one of the right-wing militia guys said that the reason they don't take the vaccine because they believe the government wants to disable them so they can't take over the government. The left-wing guy said much the same thing and they don't think that people of color should take the vaccine because it's not proven. The end result is that communities of color seem to be caught in the middle with not knowing what to believe and therefore believing what is said on the internet and doing less than they should to protect their families. And again, our mission is to convince people that the best chance that communities of color have is to take the vaccine and protect your children and your families and your old people. I'm so concerned that we're being like ping pong balls in the middle and not saying that if communities not of color don't want to take the vaccine, they're not at the same level of risk that communities of color are. And I'm wondering if you want to comment on that. I'm not, I'm not quite sure I got the question part, Dr. Maxey. I understand what you were reporting that you heard, but I didn't, I'm, I'm not sure I got your question. My question is, we know that many of these people on the right don't want to take the vaccine because they mm -hmm. believe the government is forcing them to do something that they don't want to do. And they believe that they're trying to do something to decrease their population. And I believe that communities of color stand the best chance of mitigating the effects of morbidity and mortality from the COVID and a number of other things by taking the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if these people on the right side don't wanna take it, they are less vulnerable culturally anatomically, physiologically, than many of us are. And we should not fall into the trap of saying if the guy at the country club is not taking it, I'm not going to take it. But I think our risk is multiplied. So, so, so okay. So, Dr. Maxey, my short answer to that is uh, we shouldn't be listening to them anyway. I, I, whatever whatever it is that they're saying we should do, we should not be listening to folks who have demonstrated they don't have our best interest at heart. Um, I think it goes back to what Dr. Jordan put in the chat and what he said many times before. We need to have a trusted family practice, general practice type clinician that takes care of us. And that's where we should get our health advice. The fact that somebody is even considering taking advice from someone on the internet that they don't know, it, 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 it really kind of baffles me and it makes me sad that, that somehow someone can dra dress something up and make you believe it when you have no relationship with them, they've never proven to have your best interest at heart and they're saying something just so they can get likes and make money with advertising on their TikTok, site or what have I, it, it it makes me sad that we're still doing that 
after so many people have died, after this has impacted our families so much, our neighborhoods, our communities, it makes me sad that that's even still an issue. Well, I certainly agree with that. Any thoughts, Dr. Barbara? I don't have anything really to add to, to that. Um, I do think, I do hope that sometime in the future, I have been extremely fascinated by the revelations of how uh, social media through, well, the information was, was specifically about Facebook, but how um, social media in general can and has manipulated thought processes. And other, um, I've, I've heard other discussions of actually the mechanism of how um, thought can be controlled. So I do hope at some time in the future, we can uh, hear something, uh, have a discussion about that so that we can go going forward, protect ourselves and most importantly, our young people and children um, from what they, the onslaught of what they hear and experience on the internet. Um, I think uh, we, uh, Dr. Maxey, uh, I'm seeing Dr. Sherrod has um, a hand up. Dr. Sherrod, how are you this morning, this afternoon? Oh, I'm, I'm good, Dr. Maxey. How are you all? Thank you for good. asking. Good. I just wanted to commend you all on your efforts in uh, this journey on the Black Health Trust and uh, staying with the mission. Um, I just had a comment concerning, I think it's question number four, because my mission is to promote the utilization of all of our tools in public health to try to mitigate this pandemic. And the question about gatherings, and we have two major holidays coming up, November, uh, Thanksgiving, and then Christmas. And I don't want us to forget the utilization of testing mm -hmm. uh, at that family gathering. The safest way to mitigate an outbreak would be to have everybody have a negative test, whether they are vaccinated or unvaccinated, a negative test within 72 hours of the event. And we know that the county is now providing uh, testing for free. You can also get your own self-testing at CVS or at one of the drug stores. I think it's about $20 for two tests. So you can test yourself at home. Uh, so I want people to remember that even if you are vaccinated, you can carry the virus and spread it, even, and even more so if you're unvaccinated. So the testing actually is probably the safest way of avoiding the spread of infection, having a negative test within 72 hours. There's still some risk there, but that's probably the best we can do now for a gathering is have everybody have a negative test. That is so great, Dr. What a great Appreciate comment. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Well, it looks like we're at the bottom of the hour. And uh, we want everybody to go and enjoy the rest of their Sunday. So we're going to be back again next week. And our, what's our topic going to be, Dr. Barbara? We're going to be talking about diabetes. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So we'd like you to bring all of your friends and uh, family members so we can talk about diabetes. And I think that's getting, we're getting closer and closer to Thanksgiving. So that's a very good, good topic. Dr. Ivan, you have any comment? Uh, I think I've commented enough for today. So thank you, Dr. Maxey. Thanks everyone. Then uh, we're under the grace and mercy of Pastor Pointer. Pastor, I'd like to thank uh, Simon Cooper for his excellent technical support for our program today. I'd like to thank our two co-moderators and uh, hopefully Dr. Uh, Justin Hines will be back next week. And we thank everybody for attending. Dr. Pointer. Pastor, um, I'm, I'm right here, Dr. Maxey. This, this has been a really great conversation. And um, um, I didn't put answers in the chat, but I had no idea I knew so much about diabetes and high blood pressure. 
Um, I guess I should though, because like most African Americans, um, there are markers in my own family. And I think it's important for us to know that we should know our family history and we should pay attention to our own health. And we should ask the right questions. And Dr. Walks made a suggestion earlier that I wholeheartedly believe in. If your physician is not acting in your best interest, fire him or her and find a physician who will. Amen. So let's look to the Lord and give thanks. Holy God, Jacob's God, we thank you again for granting us yet another day. An another chance as the Black Health Trust to give good information so that people would not suffer from a lack of knowledge. So show us, oh God, the things that are good and acceptable in your sight. Strengthen us so that we may do your will. And so that in this community, we should have relationships as in all families. And since we form the fabric of one community, one family, knit us together in such a way that we are warm and loving with each other. And as we leave this evening's iteration of this Black Health Trust, Show us the things that will please you and we'll be careful, oh God, to do those things. And then finally, we ask that you will stay with each of us that as we are in Diabetes Month, that we will make everyone that we know aware. And that as we are celebrating also this month, Thanksgiving, let us recognize yet again that every day is a day of Thanksgiving. We'll be careful to give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 This has been a blessing. Amen. Amen. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Praise God.